Hi, I'm Pastor Darrell Boomer, and I have the privilege of pastoring the New Glarus Bible Church here in the wonderful community of New Glarus, Wisconsin. I want to thank you for taking the time to view one of our worship services. I hope that the worship music inspires you and that the message challenges you and encourages you. Just a little bit about our church. We're a Bible-centered church. In other words, the Bible is at the center of all that we do. It's at the center of our worship services on Sunday morning. It's at the center of all the ministry that we do throughout the week. We're also a family church. We love young families, and we're uh, enjoying watching uh, more and more young families come and join us on Sunday mornings. And uh, we're also a church that cherishes our senior saints. Uh, we would love to have you come visit us sometime. Our worship service begin at 10.30 a.m. each and every Sunday morning, and I promise you'll be warmly greeted at the door. Hope to see you soon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much um, for your many, many blessings. Um, we're delighted to be able to be here today as a church family to worship you. Father, we uh, acknowledge that uh, there are many things going on in the world, many things that are unexplainable to our, our logical minds. And Lord, we need you to grant us peace and also wisdom as we navigate uh, through some really difficult times in our nation's history and our world's history. So Lord, we, we pray for that wisdom and we pray for that peace. Lord, today as we turn our eyes towards you, I pray that... Um, we would give you our full attention during our worship time, our song time. We pray that, um, that you would hear our prayers during our prayer time. We pray that our ears would be attentive as we listen to your word that is being preached. And Lord, I pray that you would use each and every person in this congregation to encourage uh, those around them. And I pray that each and every person in this congregation, as they leave today, will be encouraged. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your works. At the works of your hand I sing for joy.
One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross
Well, if you're visiting with us today, I want to let you know we've been walking through the book of Acts, and we've been discussing themes. Um, we've entitled the series that we've been doing, The Vital Signs of a Healthy Church. So we've been looking at the church, and what is it really? It's much more than a building, but uh, it's a body of believers that gather together and to worship and uh, to reach the world for Christ. And uh, we have been looking at various themes. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the theme of uh, strengthening and encouraging. Healthy churches are, strength, are encouraging churches. And uh, we're going to start off in Acts chapter 14 if you want to go there. Um, but before we get there, Acts 14. Um, you know when you're involved in a spiritually healthy church... When you come to church on Sunday morning, you are spiritually and emotionally defeated. Uh, your work week has been hard. You missed a, a promotion. You didn't get the raise that you expected. Circumstances at home have been hard. You and your spouse are having a hard time getting on the same page. Uh, this week you got a flat tire on the way to work and your dog bit you. I mean, it's just been a, a bad week. And then you come to church, and uh, your spirits get lifted. Uh, either it's through the worship music, music or it's uh, through the message that has been preached, or it's through the fellowship that takes place uh, during and after the service. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this book. It's called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Uh, how many of you are familiar with that? Yeah, Alexander wakes up in the morning and uh, he finds out that he has gum in his hair. And, uh, and then as he's going through his day, he, he doesn't get a seat by the window during the carpool to, to school. And uh, he gets to school and his mother forgot to pack a dessert for him and everybody else has a dessert. And goes out in the playground and he's ignored by his friends. And then after school, he has to go to the dentist to get a cavity fixed. And then he comes home and his mother has lima de beans for dinner. You know, and, and all the way through the book, Alexander keeps saying, I want to move to Australia because <laughs> he thinks that things are going to be better. And, and, you know, sometimes we go through weeks and we feel a little bit like Alexander. We've had a, a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad week. And uh, what we're hoping for and what we're desiring here at our church is that when you leave, that you're encouraged. Um, I have heard that if you want to lift yourself up, you should lift up someone else. And so as we continue through our series of a vitally, a spiritually healthy church, um, one of the things that we uh, are going to be talking about next week as we're closing down our series, I've got one more message that I think would be absolutely vital uh, to this series, and so we'll see if after Easter if I do that. But next week we're going to be talking about spiritually healthy churches, baptized believers. And so we'll walk in through the book of Acts next week, and we'll be looking at that theme. One of the things we're going to see today is that the leaders, the apostles, were very, very intentional to make sure that people were strengthened and encouraged in their faith. Uh, they weren't just concerned about people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They were concerned about people continuing on in what would become considered a long-distance race. Uh, uh, Christianity isn't a sprint. It's a long-distance race. Uh, the Apostle Paul called it a boxing match. He, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And, and there are weeks when, you know, let's face it, where we just feel like we, we've been beat up. I was talking to one of my friends this week at Awana, and I asked him how his day was, and, and he had an absolutely terrible day. I mean, he got beat up, and he didn't do anything wrong. It was one of those days where uh, no good turn um, how does that go? Um, exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> you want to come on up? <laughs> but that's exactly what I was looking for. 
he didn't do anything wrong but no deed no good deed got unpunished and we're we're going to go to acts chapter 14 i want to start there and just kind of explain a little bit about what we're going to see as we walk through the book of acts so it says in verses 21 that they preached the good news in that city speaking of paul and barnabas they won a large one number of disciples and then they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Um, there's a few things that are interesting about this, and one of them is this, is that um, when you're winning people to the Lord, um, you also want to keep them encouraged in the Lord. Uh, it says here that they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. What's interesting about that is this, is that in Lystra, um, the Apostle Paul had been stoned almost to the point of death. They dragged him out of the city. Uh, Paul revived and he went back into Lystra. That's kind of significant. Uh, another thing that's significant is that when he was stoned in Lystra, uh, there were people that came from Iconium and Antioch, and they're the ones who stirred up the trouble. And Paul had started a church in Iconium and Antioch. And so rather than avoid those cities, he went to those cities. Do you know why he did that? Because there were believers there in the churches that he had begun, and he knew that they were going to need to be strengthened and encouraged in their faith. Paul didn't run away from those cities. He very intentionally went to those cities. Um, we're going to see today that the apostles were very, very intentional to make sure that people, not only did they win people to the Lord, but they kept people strong and encouraged in the Lord. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're going to talk about encouraging people in their faith. Uh, a spiritual encouragement is like oxygen to the soul. We all need it. And that's why we gather together here on Sunday mornings, hopefully to be encouraged and strengthened. Uh, the Greek word for encouragement is parakalio. Pericolio. It's a compound word, and it's found throughout the New Testament. It's found many times in the book of Acts. We're going to see some of that today. And basically what it means is this. It means that you are strongly encouraging someone to do something, but with an equal commitment to lovingly come alongside them and help them to do it. Okay, so in other words, you see people and you, you know that there are things that they need to do and you tell them this is what you should do, this is what you need to do, but you don't just tell them that. You come alongside them and say, you know what? I'm going to help you to do it. So the word uh, para uh, means to come alongside. Uh, we, we use it in, in many different ways in our language here in America. Uh, we talk about a parachute, right? A parachute is something that goes with you as you jump out of an airplane. It comes alongside of you. Uh, we talk about a paramedic. A paramedic is somebody that comes alongside of you as you're being rushed in an ambulance to the hospital. Um, they help you, and they come alongside of you. Uh, the word para means to come alongside. The word kalio means to verbally call out someone. Uh, so in other words, when you take these two words and you smash them together, it means that you're constantly coming along somebody, uh, alongside of them and saying, hey, you know, this is something you got to do. I'm going to help you do it. Probably one of the most aggravating things you can have is a person who's constantly telling you, you should do this or you should do that. You know what I mean? After a while, it's like, I'm getting tired of your shoulds, you know? But when they say you should do this, and then they tell you why you should do it, and then they say, I'll help you to do it, that's encouragement. That's what that encouragement looks like. So, uh, you know, this is what it should look like in the church. We should constantly be reaching down and trying help to help people to come up. 
This is called encouragement. And I'm hoping in every Sunday when you leave here, you know, somehow, some way, you have been encouraged. Um, I want to show you a model of encouragement. Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 4, verse 36, Acts 4, verse 36, and uh, there we meet a man, and we're familiar with the story because we talked about it a while ago. And, and the man's name is, in verse 36, Joseph. And, and he's a Levite from Cyprus. In other words, he's a religious man, and whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Well, Barnabas sold a field he owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas was the kind of guy um, that was constantly encouraging you, and he would encourage you in any way that he could. In this situation, uh, the early church, there were many people with needs, and Barnabas looked and he said, you know, I have a means of helping those people with their needs. I'm going to sell a piece of property, I'm going to take the money, I'm going to lay it at the apostles' feet so that they can distribute it to those who have needs. And, and, and he was so encouraged they gave him the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. We get to see Barnabas in action. In Acts chapter 9, we're familiar with Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. He, he goes from Saul, the great persecutor, and uh, he has an encounter with the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he ends up being Paul, the great apostle. I mean, he has a, a, um, a moment on the road to Damascus where he is truly converted. And then what Saul begins to do, uh, we see later in Acts chapter 9, he, he starts to preach Jesus. And in the process, people are coming to faith in Jesus. It says in Acts 9, 22, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan, and day and night they kept a close watch in the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. And you know what? We'd do the very same thing. This guy has been killing our friends and family. And so we appear a little hesitant about bringing him into the fold. But I want you to see verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. But Barnabas, everybody else is re rejecting Saul. But Barnabas said, hey, we, we, we need to accept this guy. We need to bring him in. He's on our team now. I want you to think what would have happened, humanly speaking, if Barnabas hadn't brought Paul in. What if Paul had been captured by the Jewish people? And they had killed him. That was their plan. Do you know that uh, Paul has probably written uh, half of the New Testament? You know that Paul has written down much, much uh, fantastic doctrine that we, the church needs today? Do you know that half of the book of Acts is about the journey of Saul, the persecutor, becoming Paul, the apostle, and, 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 and the things that he did in the book of Acts? But Barnabas, you know, when we look at this passage, one of the things that we see is that we can be like a Barnabas. And we can be the kind of people that open up doors. And we have no idea how much impact that's going to have 
on others. Let's go to Acts chapter 11. I, I just want to uh, show you this tremendous dynamic duel, uh, Paul and Barnabas, in Acts chapter 11, in verse 19. Uh, the church has been scattered. They've all left Jerusalem because of uh, persecution there. They have gone out into all these cities and they've begun to tell other people about Jesus. And, and uh, there's a church, it's in Antioch. And, and in Antioch, uh, the church is exploding. It says in verse 21, The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. All of a sudden in Antioch, there's a revival. Verse 22, uh, news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. They said, man, there's a revival going on in Antioch. What are we going to do? So what did they do? They sent Barnabas to Antioch. Why did they send Barnabas? Because he was a great encourager. He was a great encourager. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad. And what did he do? He encouraged them. You know, he just did what he does. And he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Look at verse 24. We get to see a description of who Barnabas was. He was a good man. Do you guys like good men? Barnabas was a good man. Not only was he a good man, he was full of the Holy Spirit. Not only was he full of the Holy Spirit, he was full of faith. And what happened? And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas, so we got a revival going on there. There's more and more believers. And and Barnabas is going, what are we going to do with all these believers? He goes, we need more staff. So in verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for who? For Saul, Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul, Paul, met with the church, and they taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. In other words, there was something going on in Antioch as as, uh, Paul and Barnabas are teaching these new believers. The new believers, their lives are being transformed, and they're transformed to the point where the the people are mocking them and saying, oh, look at all these these little Christians, these little Christ. They act just like Jesus. Yeah. They were having a tremendous effect there in Antioch. You know, when I, when I envision Barnabas, I, I envision a guy, the kind of person you want around. I envision a guy who, who is always smiling. He's always seeing the best in others and always seeing the best in situations. I envision a man who has a very loud belly laugh. You know, he's just the kind of guy you want to be around. So the church is growing and they go and recruit Saul Paul and and they stay there for a whole year here's a question for you what what does it mean to strengthen a church does it mean you bring in some barbells and some free weights and maybe schedule a Pilates class in the morning is that what it means what does it mean well to strengthen the church as it says here in verse 27 means that you teach them You teach them. And that's what Paul and Barnabas did. They came in and and they began to teach them. And as they began to teach them, uh, they learned more and more about Christ. They learned more and more about their faith. And they became stronger and stronger Christians. Here's some of the things that I'm sure that Paul and Barnabas taught them. I'm sure they taught them about uh, Jesus' substitutionary, the death. The fact that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. I'm sure he taught them about that. I'm sure that he taught them about about the Holy Spirit. I'm sure that he taught them about the fundamentals of the faith. I am sure that he taught them this is how you ought to live as a believer. And as he did that, the church was strengthened. Let's go to Acts chapter 12, verses 24 through 25. 
Paul and Barnabas are continuing to minister together the dynamic duel and it says here but the word of God continued to increase and spread and when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission they returned from Jerusalem taking with them John also Mark so anyway they go to um, to Jerusalem and while they're in Jerusalem um, actually they're in Antioch chapter 13 verse 1 they, they've got a full bench of wonderful leaders. They've got like five uh, prophets and teachers, and a number of them are uh, Saul and, and Barnabas. And it says in verse 2, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. So uh, Saul and Barnabas were needed somewhere else. And the Holy Spirit said to the church there, these two guys, I have a special mission for them. They prayed, they set their hands on them, they sent them off. You know, God does that. He's the one who moves people around. He's the one who will bring people into a church. He's the one who will take people out of the church. He says, I need them someplace else. Let's go to Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And at Conium, uh, Paul and Barnabas went as usual in the Jewish synagogue. That's what they would do. They'd come into a town, and we're going to meet people who want to know about God. We're going to go to the synagogue. And there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. So now they're in, in Iconium. They're having a, an effective ministry and uh, they're strengthening and encouraging people. Um, they're giving people oxygen for their soul. What does it mean to strengthen and encourage? It means uh, that you strengthen and encourage a church by telling it the truth. Go to Acts chapter 14, 21. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. It says, They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. And they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. People need to hear truth. And sometimes they need to hear hard truth. Sometimes they need to know that, you know, if you're going to be a Christian, uh, you're going to go through many trials um, if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. And another thing they did is they strengthened the church by putting leadership in place. Um, it says down here that in verse 23, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church with prayer and fasting. Um, you strengthen a church by bringing leaders in. It's one of the ways you do it. Another way you strengthen the church is by discipling the next generation. And in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5, we, we hear about Paul, or Paul and Silas, actually, and they come into a community that's called Philippi. And at Philippi, there's a, um, a young man whose name is uh, Timothy, actually is Derby and Lystra. And uh, what Paul did is they had heard such good things about Timothy, he brought him on and and Timothy traveled with him. He discipled him. Later on, Timothy became a leader at a church. And Paul wrote to him, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. These are all ways that they strengthen the church. And now I have a question for you. How can the people in the pew strengthen the church? You're thinking, you're thinking well, that's great for Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas. But what about me? What can I do? And so I have nine things for you that you can do that can strengthen our church. Uh, each and every one of them uh, has an S in it. So the first one would be this. Stay with the church that God leads you to. 
until God releases you. Stay in the church that God leads you to until God releases you. Go to Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 11. Paul is led to a church in Corinth. In Corinth, he's going through some persecution. Verse 9, one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you and no one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. Paul, I want you to stay in Corinth. I know you got many people that are going to attack you. I want to let you know that I'm with you. I also want to let you know I have many people in this city. Verse 11, so Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. He stayed in Corinth for as long as God wanted him to stay in Corinth. One of the things that happens in many, many churches is that people become church hoppers or church shoppers and and, uh, you're perpetually looking for a church that has all the programs that you want, that that has uh, the preacher that that you like, that has a worship team that you like, and uh, just going from church to church to church. But if you stay in the church that God leads you to and you strengthen that church with your gifts and your abilities, that church will become more and more as God wants it to be not as you want it to be. Um, From my understanding, there was a time in this church where uh, they were dangerously close to closing the doors. They had read a book called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church, and they they looked around and they said, you know, we've got a lot of signs of heading towards spiritual death. But there were leaders in this church that continued to say, continue to pray. And God has been working And God is still working in our church. Why? Because they stayed and they prayed. Uh, Number two, have have a sweet spirit. Um, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, there, there, there is no perfect church. Every church has its quirks. Uh, But we get to decide how we're going to deal with our church's imperfections. Amen? But you know, if everybody comes to church and becomes involved in a church and has the fruit of the Spirit, I mean, hey, I like hanging out with people like that. Don't you? I like hanging out with with loving people, joyful people, peaceful people, patient people, kind people, good, good people. I love hanging around with people like that. And so one of the things that we can do to strengthen our church is is to just have a good attitude, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens is God strengthens the church um, because of our attitudes. Uh, number three, another thing that we can do is we can spur people on. We can, we can be committed to spurring others on to love and good deeds. We can be a, an encourager. Uh, let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good week, good works. Uh, one of the things that you can do is make a commitment that you're going to encourage at least one person a day. And uh, you're going to make a commitment to, to write a card to someone who needs encouragement. You, you notice somebody hasn't been here for two or three weeks. You say, you know what? Uh, you write their name down. I'm going to go get out my directory, and I'm going to write that person a card, and I'm going to let them know I missed them. And you know what? Your card coming from you is going to mean more to them than a card coming from the pastor. Because they'll know that they are being missed. Um, When you see somebody doing something special, it's good to take the time to write them a, not a general card, like, oh, you're so helpful, but a very specific card. I I, I can remember one day... um, we had a very sick child out in our fellowship hall, and uh, uh, its sickness ended up all over the floor. <laughs> and there were two ladies that immediately grabbed towels and got down on the floor and started to clean it up. You know, you, you could say something to them about that. That, you know, thank you so much for your helpful attitude. 
Uh, we had a, a Sunday where we were doing baptisms here, and, uh, and one of our deacons overfilled the baptismal tank. I won't say which one that was, Al. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then we baptized a very large young man, and the water came spilling all over the tank, and, and immediately one of our people jumped up, ran down to our janitor's closet, and grabbed the, the mop and the bucket and came and started cleaning it up, you know. These are, these are wonderful things. You know, we can we can spur people on to love and good works by acknowledging the things that they're doing. Uh, another thing we can do is stick to the scriptures. You know, and I wouldn't be here if this was a church that wasn't um, sticking with the scriptures. I, I I have absolutely nothing to give to you of any value, other than what comes out of this book. Are you with me? I have, I, have, I have no good advice for you. Um, I can maybe tell you a joke, but that isn't going to benefit you much. Um, but we need to stick with the Scriptures. Everybody in our church needs to be committed to reading and studying and hearing what, what God's Word has to say and then, and then in applying it to their lives. In, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it says, now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. You know, one of the things that you can do is you can listen to the Word as it's being preached or your Sunday school teaching and, and seeing is, you know, does that really line up with what the Scripture says? Because we as a church, what we want to do is we want to stick with the Scriptures. Amen? We need to understand that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's useful to teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So as I'm speaking here right now, God is equipping you for a good work that He's called you to. So we need to stick with the Scriptures. Uh, another thing is be sold out. Be sold out uh, to all of the things of the Lord. You know, you're, you're, you're be sold out to have your marriage uh, be a biblical marriage, to have your family uh, be a biblical family, and, and, and be sold out to your church family. It, it says in Matthew chapter 6, 33, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Be sold out. And when you're sold out, what happens is that strengthens the church. You know, our goal here is to build lifelong, fully devoted believers. And, and from the cradle to the grave. Um, we want to be an intergenerational church. Our goal is to build happy, healthy, and holy families. Uh, our church exists to bring people into a life-changing and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Okay? Be sold out. Next one, uh, seek out opportunities to tell other people about Jesus. Uh, Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said, Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. And so that's God's goal for each and every one of us, that we would not be fishermen. You can be a fisherman if you want, but he wants us to be fishers of men. And so what we need to be doing is seeking opportunities you know, to show love and compassion and, and do kind deeds in our community and let God open up the doors where we can tell them about Jesus. I, I, I heard recently that um, nine people in Greene County have committed suicide already this year. And uh, nine is usually how many people commit suicide in a year. There's a lot of people that are really, really hurting. I, I was at the gym on Friday, and um, I connected there with a Christian brother that goes to another church and trying to build that community. That's one of the things we're trying to do here. And uh, a little bit later, a teenager came in that I know, and he was over on the bench, and I wanted to talk to him for a moment. And I knew that recently somebody very significant to him had died, had passed away. And so I just told him, you know, that I was sorry to hear that and that I will pray for you. I walked 
from the bench where I was talking to him. I got over here to the door as I'm leaving. There's an elderly couple coming in. I told them they were late. They were late because they usually come in earlier in the day um, when I'm there earlier. And they said, yeah, we, we just came from a funeral. Uh, a person that was very dear to us in their 50s had died. We were at a funeral. And once again, I'm sorry to hear, you know, hear that. You know, praying that one day the doors will open up when I can tell them about Christ. But we need to be active in our community and, and um, seeking opportunities to share Christ. That strengthens our church. Another thing we can do, number seven, we need to be sensitive to the needs of others, especially those in your church family. And it says in Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the house of faith. So in other words, as we're a part of our church, what we need to do is we need to keep our eyes open and, and our ears open to what are the needs of the people in the church. And as it says here, we, we need to, to do good. We need to come alongside of them and encourage them and, and walk with them through their difficulties. We need, to, we need to make them pans of food that we can bring to their home when uh, they, they're too busy or they can't cook. Um, we need to be sensitive to the needs of others in our church family. Uh, we need to steward our resources. Uh, we need to give generously to God first and, and then to your church. Uh, we need to be like Barnabas. You know, he saw a need in his church. He sold a plot of land and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet so they could distribute it as they saw needs. Uh, one of the things that holds many churches back and I want to say, first off, this is a very generous church, a very giving church. But one of the things that really holds a lot of churches back is the lack of finances. They just can't take that next step in ministry because they, they don't have the money to do it. And so if we're all wise stewards and we're all giving generously and giving sacrificially, um, as God opens up doors, we'll be able to, to walk through those doors. Um, our, our church is growing and um, one day we could benefit from possibly having another pastor notice I said another pastor not a different pastor okay I just want, <laughs> want to point that out <laughs> but there are ministry opportunities perhaps that we can't take advantage of because we just don't have the bandwidth and so, you know, we need to steward our resources. And I have one more for you. For those of you who are taking notes, I had eight, but I want to add a ninth, and that is uh, be a servant. Be a servant. Um, First Peter chapter 4 tells us that each and every one of us has spiritual gifts. Some of us have serving gifts. Some of us have speaking gifts. Some of us have leadership gifts. We're, we're, we're encouraged to use them. It says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of, of God's various grace, varied grace. Whoever speaks is one speaking the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belong glory, dominion, forever and ever. Amen. So there's nine things that you can do to strengthen your church. And I, I want you to prayerfully be considering those. Um, you know, when we look at the Bible, at God's Word, it gives us everything we need to do ministry. And, and um, the needs that they had back in the earlier churches in Acts are the very same needs that we have today. And one of the things we see when we look at the apostles is they were very, very intentional with strengthening the church and encouraging the church. They went out of their way to do that. So I want to give you very quickly five challenges um, concerning encouragement. Um, and you can write these down and, and prayerfully consider them. Number one is that you can, 
encourage somebody every day. Just write that out. Every day I'm going to encourage someone. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Therefore encourage each other with these words. What were the words? Well, the words was, uh, the Lord's coming back. Encourage somebody every single day. It says in Hebrews chapter th uh, 3 verse 13, Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. And, and, and encouragement is like, and you've all been there because you all live in Wisconsin. Um, you know, it's the middle of winter. You're, you're at Walmart. And uh, you go into the store and you left your battery, your lights on, and you come out and, and your car's dead. You've all experienced something like that, right? And it, it's 20 below. And, and the, the snow is piling up. And you don't have jumper cables. So what do you pray for? You pray for somebody that has jumper cables to come alongside of you. They see that your hood's up, that you're hurting, and they drive alongside of you. They put their hood up. They get out their jumper cables. And over a period of time, the, the life that is in their battery comes over into your dead battery. And then you turn on your engine, your engine starts, your heat turns on, and your lights come on. You know, encouragement is like that. And what we need to be as, as believers is we need to be looking out for people who have their hood up in a dead battery. And what we need to do is we need to jump out and put our, our jumper cables onto our live battery. We need to come over to them with their dead battery, and we need to recharge their batteries. We need to encourage someone daily. Uh, here, here's another challenge. Pray for God to make you an encourager. Pray that God would uh, show you how to, to encourage. Pray that God would show you where encouragement is needed. Number three, I challenge you to study Barnabas and Paul and ask God to make you like them. I got one more passage I want you to go to. Go to Romans chapter 16. I want you to show, I want to show you um, an encourager in action. His name is Paul. It's towards the end of his life. Acts chapter 16. <laughs> I want to be like this guy right here. Acts chapter 16. Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. She's a servant of the church in Centria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way uh, worthy of the saints and, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. What if your name was Phoebe? And you're to read this. You go, wow, Paul said a lot of good things about me. But Paul doesn't stop with Phoebe. Go down to verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all of the churches of the Gentiles are, are grateful to them. Priscilla and Aquila, I think, are getting encouraged. And greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. And if you're Epinetus and you, you read that, you go, Wow. Paul's my dear friend. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You, you go down a little bit further, and he says, Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Mary's reading this, go, Wow, Paul thinks I'm a hard worker. Greet Andronicus and Judas, my, my relatives who have, have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Paul called me outstanding. Go down a little further. Greet Amphiliadus, whom I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and, and my dear friend Stasius. Greet Apelletus, tested and proved in Christ. And, and Paul just goes on and on and on and just encouraging person after person after person. You know, we ought to pray that God would make us more like Barnabas and Paul. Number four, pray, pray that God would show you the, who to encourage. 
you know, around you every single day are some people that could just use a little bit of encouragement. Amen? Every day you run into them. And the last one, pray that God would create a culture of encouragement in our church. That when people would come in here on Sunday morning, they've got a dead battery, they've had a terrible, horrible, very bad, no good day, that when they leave the church, that, um, that they would be encouraged and strengthened in their faith. And I want to just end with this. The greatest encourager of all was Jesus Christ. He encouraged us with the fact that he came down to the earth in the form of a man and uh, took on the, the form of a servant. Um, he even went to the cross and died on the cross on our behalf. And he did that so that we could have eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and um, we'd have abundant life. Jesus is the ultimate encourager. And so if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you know, I would encourage you, uh, number one, to admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Number two, place your faith in Jesus. And then number three, begin to follow him. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for uh, our series through the book of Acts as we, we learn about uh, the vital signs of a spiritually healthy church. Lord, I pray that each and every lesson that we've learned thus far or that you would incorporate it into our lives i pray the day that as people leave that they would um, be mindful to strengthen and encourage those around them in the faith i pray that our church would become a place that is just filled with encouragement for all of those who are discouraged and i pray this in christ's name amen
a benediction for us today. It's out of Second Thessalonians. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. You're dismissed. <laughs>